With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number, 877-973-7425. I hope you guys have a stockpile of fireworks. I, I feel like I should do my PSA duty, though, and tell you just be careful if it hadn't rained a lot where you are. Don't set off a forest fire. Smokey Bear would be upset with you. Um, you know, I guess it was, what was it, a couple of years ago where I am, they, they banned shooting fireworks because it was just so dry. It hadn't rained in like a month, and they were afraid people would start fires. Um, luckily, we've had a lot of rain uh, in the last week or so where I am. So you guys just be careful out there. Um, enjoy the holiday weekend uh, as best you can, wherever you are. Uh, I want to take your phone calls and I got a lot of people on hold, but I've got to actually get into this because this is going viral and not in a good way. And it comes as Joe Biden is now record low in popularity. And this is Brian Deese. You should know Brian Deese. This is um, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors for the president. He was also the head of ESG for BlackRock, the private equity group. Um, he was in charge of making sure they pressured companies into uh, pursuing left-wing agendas. And now he's in the White House and his clip has gone viral. Uh, I want to do something charitable, however. I actually want to play not just the little clip that has gone viral. I want to play the full context of his clip because I, I want to do be charitable here. It's still not good. This is what he said. Well, what you heard from the president today was a clear articulation of the stakes. This is about the future of the liberal world order, and we have to stand firm. But at the same time, what I'd say to that family and to Americans across the country is you have a president administration that is going to do everything in its power to blunt the, those price increases and bring those prices down. Uh, good news, over the last two weeks we've seen the price of gas at the pump come down about 20 cents, but still unacceptably high. That's why the president, before he was at NATO in the G7 earlier this week, was working to bring the G7 allies together around exploring something around a price cap to cap the price uh, that uh, can be paid for Russian oil, which will actually target the pain more directly on Vladimir Putin uh, and not on the rest of the world. It's why you have the president calling for, here at home, a temporary gas tax holiday, not only at the federal level, but for states to follow the lead and take equivalent actions as well. And it's why we are engaged with the industry, encouraging them to increase supply, increase supply of oil right now, and also increase that refinery capacity that we know those companies took offline during the pandemic. We need to get more of that online so that we get more gas into the system. All of these steps, uh, none of them is a silver bullet alone, but you've got an administration that's working on every angle we can to try to keep this price reduction that we're seeing going. Now, again, I thought it was important to play the full clip. The problem for Brian Deese is that it's the beginning that has gone viral with the question from the CNN anchor. The military analyst, the director of national intelligence, uh, they say that this could be a long e a war measured in years. And I think everybody understands why this is happening. But is it sustainable? What do you say to those families who say, listen, we can't afford to pay four eighty five a gallon for months, if not years. This is just not sustainable. Well, what you heard from the president today was a clear articulation of the stakes. This is about the future of the liberal world order, and we have to stand firm. This was about the future of the liberal world order, and we have to stand firm. I want to be very clear here. I was in favor of and do not wish to penalize the president of the United States for blocking the importation of Russian oil. He should not be punished for blocking the importation of Russian oil. He did the right thing and a majority of Americans supported it. The problem, however, is that this administration is using that uh, to distract from all of the things that they could do domestically. Brian Deese says, well, you have to deal with this pain at the pump. 
for the liberal world order. Now, he's not meaning liberal as in progressives. He means the Western world order. We have to stand firm for the West against Vladimir Putin. We have to stand firm against the tyrants of the world. So you must pay at the pump more. That's not a good message for the American people. You went from saying, well, this is Putin's gas tax increase to, well, you got to suck it up for the liberal world order. That's not a good message. It's a very arrogant, out-of-touch message, perhaps the most out-of-touch message that has come from this White House, that this is somehow your duty. Again, the president should not be punished for blocking the importation of Russian oil. It was the right thing to do. The problem is that they would like you to believe that the fallout we're suffering right now with gas at the pump is all because of him doing that, and therefore he shouldn't be punished. No, there is so much this administration has done to cause the price of gas to go up. They have imposed new regulations. They have made it more expensive to uh, rebuild refineries. They have shut down excess capacity pipelines. They have stopped the drilling on federal land. They have slow walked the approval of leases. They've slow walked the approval of builds once the leases are approved. They've curtailed the amount of available ocean in the Gulf of Mexico that can be drilled. They've done tons and tons of things to make it impossible to get oil out of the ground, including driving up the Wall Street calls for ANWR, pressuring groups like BlackRock that Brian Deese used to work for to not invest in the oil production out of ANWR so then they could say, well, in lieu of banks giving them loans, since nobody is, we're going to shut down the project. That was all by design to curtail American domestic capacity. Emmanuel Macron told Joe Biden the other day that uh, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia have no more capacity. They are at max capacity. And the implication there was that the United States itself must and should drill more and produce more and refine more. Our refineries are at max capacity here. Why? Because the Biden administration imposed new regulations on emissions at refineries that are so costly that refineries can't upgrade the refineries without losing a bunch of money. And they're not going to lose a bunch of money. These are investor-driven businesses. They want to make a profit. And when you deny people a profit motive, they're not going to do business. It's very simple economics. You may may not like it, you may condemn it, you may think they got to take one for the team, but they're not going to and they don't have to and that's not the way this thing works. But it's what the Biden administration wants. And so at the end of the day, they're left telling you, suck it up for the liberal world order. This isn't World War II. This isn't Vietnam. The existential threat doesn't seem to be an existential threat to most people. They haven't made the case that it's global war. By the way, we haven't declared war. Why do we have to pay and and feel the pain at the pump for the liberal world order when, according to this administration, we are not at war? All they can do is blame other people and you. They're blaming you for the audacity of complaining about high gas prices. That's dumb, number one. Number two, it's very out of touch. And three, it's going to cause long-term fallout for the Democrats in the run-up to November. They can scream about Roe v. Wade all they want, but it's not going to help them When they're out there telling people you got to suck it up for the liberal world order, that just is tone deaf stupid. Here's Reince Prevence. He was on Fox News talking about how the Democrats are are scrambling on this. The deck was stacked early on, as we all know, when the Republicans were kicked off the committee by Nancy Pelosi. But look, the Democrats are looking for any unicorn they can find to save them from the dead, whether it be January 6th, whether it be... Uh, abortion, whether it be guns. I mean, this is the secret life of Joe Biden. He's living, as you pointed out, he is living in, in the world of his own fantasies. And you, you spelled it out. We talk about gas prices. You say, oh, it's Putin's fault. 
mean, forget about all the executive orders that he signed that you've talked about a million times. Uh, uh, the abortion opinion. Oh, uh, they're going to come after gay marriage next. And then on inflation today, he says, oh, well, the rest of the world's got it a lot worse. Well, uh, you know, a quick little search on Google will tell you that our neighbors in Canada and Mexico, their inflation number is actually lower than the United States. So, look, they've got to change the narrative. They're find, grabbing at anything they can find because people aren't happy, and when you're not happy, you can't win elections. Exactly. Now, over to David Axelrod, Barack Obama's um, Svengali, I guess you could say. I like Axelrod. Um, we disagree on everything. He's a nice guy. He knows politics. He knows the pulse of the country. He was on CNN. Earlier, we referred to a, a new poll showing that 85% of the American people think the United States is heading in the wrong direction. That, frankly, points to disaster for Democrats in November. Yeah. Look, uh, there are a lot of, you know, if you were looking at the chart, you'd say the vitals are not good. The president's approval ratings at 38%. The, his economic ratings are low. Consumer confidence is down. The number that you uh, mentioned. The one thing that I don't know is how this uh, <clears throat> ruling by the Supreme Court last week is going to affect things. I've heard from people all over the country who've been doing focus groups and polling this week. And it really does seem to have galvanized people. And not just about this issue, but concerns about Republicans uh, and extremism and uh you know, if I were a Republican strategist, I'd be a little bit worried about that right now. Uh, I, I don't think we fully understand what the political impact is going to be, uh, but that is one countervailing fact. But on the basic numbers, you're absolutely right, and I think everybody recognizes that this, uh, at current course and speed, this could be a very painful fall for Democrats. Yes. We don't know yet the impact of abortion. My guess is that it's not going to have as much of an impact except on Democrats who are already going to go vote. A little more from Axel right here. There is this sense that things are kind of out of control and he's not in command. And this uh, and this lends, uh, you know, lends to that. Uh, you know, inflation is no one president could control inflation, but it is a, a you know, it's a gale force wind right now. It's affecting politics. Very hard to come, you know, to, you, you heard him on gas prices today, talks about the gas tax holiday, but he's not going to get the gas tax holiday. And there are a lot of Americans who are skeptical about whether that would uh, that would help. Uh, so, there, you know, this is a very, very freighted, a uh, fraught environment for him right now. <laughs> yes, it is. And because it's a fraught environment for him, it's a fraught environment for the Democrats in general. I just continue to believe, and I could be wrong. Democrats tell me I'm wrong, but I really do think that in the next four months, gas prices and inflation and the economy, they're not improving. And when people go vote in November, that's going to be at the forefront of their mind, not the Dobbs case in the Supreme Court. And I think that changes the dynamics for the Democrats. Okay, here's what I want to do. I want to go in and take a commercial break. And when I come back, I'm going to spend some time with your phone calls. Uh, be patient. 877-973-7425. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. And I'm going to be a good boy and watch the clock for Jim so he can push and, and re-push buttons that wind up and slow things down during this short segment with phone calls. But before I get there, I've got to tell you, if you text the word data to 33777, I'll send you back a link. If you click it, you can subscribe to not just my daily show notes where you get all the stuff I'm talking about, but also check out my morning piece, the title, you'll love it, Best Pride Month Ever talking about the Supreme Court wins and basically rehashing what I said at the very beginning of the show that um, the left's problem is not that they think democracy is dying, but that they think they're actually going to have to get their hands dirty and engage in it. So text DATA to 33777. Now, I do want to take some phone calls. Uh, Gene, been waiting very patiently. Welcome to the program, Gene. Thank you again. <clears throat> First one, I have two quick points. First, mega, mega do uh, kudos for the opening monologue. Thank you. That's the best opening monologue I've heard from anybody. Thank you very most much. Uh, <clears throat> next question on uh, CAFE standards. Is there a chance that those get to be revisited and recreated? Uh, no, because there actually is a federal law that uh, dis 
specifically allows uh, CAFE standards uh, and, and gave that to the EPA to do. So that one won't be uh, revised. Uh, some of the other EPA powers may be. And you know, the EPA can still regulate uh, climate change and, and emissions. They just have to do it through different methods than what they wanted to do. So uh, the problem here, I think, for federal agencies, though, is, it gets to your point, Gene, is that you're going to have a lot of people go through and say, which regulations can we now challenge under the major questions doctrine? And I suspect there will be a lot of them. Uh, Carl, you're going to be next. Welcome. Carl? Hello? Hi there. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, with the whole global warming thing, something I'm not hearing anybody talk about is the fact that we're in an elliptical orbit around the sun. We're not in a circular <laughs> orbit. It's yeah. elliptical. And we're approaching our closest point to the sun over the next 800 to 1,000 years. So every year we're getting a little closer and a little closer, and it's going to get so warm that, you know, I don't know what we're going to have to do, but uh, they're finding bodies that carbon date back 50,000 years, and one that even thinks 100,000 years. So we've lived through this before. I don't know if maybe it turns the tundra in northern Canada into a climate that we know Hawaii to be today. Um, but, you know, the greenhouse, you know, and this would happen whether human beings were ever on Earth or not. Uh, yeah, greenhouse yeah, you know, gases I, are, are real, and we need to keep them under control. And 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 we we did a good job at uh, uh, letting the ozone repair itself by not venting out so much refrigerant and things like that. But nobody's talking about the elliptical orbit. I'm I'm glad you said that uh, because it's one thing I pointed out that look, I, I really do think that. When you got, or actually, I don't know if y'all have heard this or not, but we will be crossing the 8 billion person threshold later this year. Um, when you got 7.9 billion people on planet Earth, obviously, I think we have an impact on the environment. We, we live in symbiosis with the environment, or read the Bible if you don't believe me. Uh, so we've got to have some sort of impact. But I think that the left is so man-centric, they can't acknowledge the natural phenomena as well. As Carl says, we're in an elliptical orbit of, around a giant nuclear ball of plasma. Uh, they found signs of global warming on Mars and even on Neptune. Um, this is a natural phenomenon as well. And, and they're so uh, man-centric, they think we do it all. And, you know, we just need to adapt. We need to adapt. We don't need to give up our Western lifestyle. It's just remarkable to me that when they thought there was global cooling and now they think there's global warming and the solution to both is always for Western society to give up being Western society. That tells me there's more dogma here than anything else. All right, I've only got about a minute, so I'm going to uh, go to commercial break here and then spend the next half hour on your phone calls. Uh, the phone number is 877-973-7425. Uh, you do need to know the Atlanta Federal Reserve has dropped their current measure of second quarter GDP to negative 2.1%. After the economic data this week, if it holds, it would be back-to-back -back quarters of contraction, suggesting, as I mentioned yesterday, we may already be in a recession, uh, and the Fed is going to have to try to figure out how to navigate that. The problem is, when you get into a recession, what do you do to try to get out of a recession? You lower interest rates. But you can't lower interest rates when you have inflation, because it makes more inflation. And the Fed's got more of an obligation to deal with inflation than employment. So they're going to keep raising interest rates. And that's going to slow down the economy pretty dramatically. Uh, we are in for some rough economic waters. Again, that suggests to me that come November, the economy is going to be at the forefront of people's minds. Uh, and these cultural issues before the Supreme Court will not be. But what happens if it goes upside down? What about if Democrats win? Well, we'll explore those issues. We got some callers on that topic. We'll get there. 877-973-7425. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. Delighted to have you with me. The phone number is 877-973-7425. I'm going to spend a lot of time this half hour 
on phone calls. It is, of course, uh, the 4th of July Independence Day uh, weekend, and I want to give the audience their due, given so much news we've had. The last couple of weeks, we've been very limited in phone calls because there's been so much news I've had to cover. And today, well, let's let's go for it. Let us uh, begin with Scott. Welcome to the program. Hey, Eric. Just wanted to thank you for yesterday clarifying the uh, the Bibles that were used in the uh, the oath for Judge uh, Jackson. I had a question for you, though. What Bibles would you use if you were um, taking the oath for the Supreme Court and why? And then a follow-up question would be, do you prefer to study with a physical Bible or do you use a digital version? Oh, uh, oh. I'll hang up and listen to your response. All right. Uh, so first of all, um, I think I would do exactly what Katanji Brown Jackson did, which is use the uh, the top Bible being uh, the family Bible and then the bottom Bible being the historic Bible of the Supreme Court that all the justices lay their hands on. Uh, you know, the original report was that she had used one from Thurgood Marshall's family, but it was actually not. Uh, it was the Supreme Court's own Bible that all the members of the court have used uh, historically going back generations. So, yeah, I think I would do that. Uh, as for study, uh, I actually like the printed page. I don't like digital. Now, I use when I'm doing sermons, and, and I rarely get asked these days to preach, uh, but uh, when I do, I've, I've got some software that I use uh, that you that dives into uh, the Bible so I can pull out the words and, and make sure I understand what the real original Greek or the original Hebrew was, makes it uh, a, a deeper dive, references different commentaries and stuff on those passages. So if I'm preparing a sermon, I use digital. But if I'm sitting, I like to read. One of the coolest things I've bought in the last couple of years is actually uh, from Crossways Publishing. It's an ESV Bible series, and literally each book of the Bible is its own little bound book. Some of them very small, some of them bigger. Uh, Isaiah, of course, Jeremiah, pretty thick. Um, Acts being one of the thicker ones of the New Testament. But each they're each an individual book. And they have on one side of the page is the scripture and on the other side are just lines so you can write notes on. And I've started doing that. So I'm trying to, I, I, confession, I'm really terrible at remembering to read scripture. It does me a world of good to do it. And, and it is amazing how often I'm terrible at doing it. Um, but I have the I have the individual books, so I don't have to carry my big Bible. I have an ESV study Bible uh, that um, R.C. Sproul's group, uh, Ligonier Ministries, put together, and that's my to-go Bible that I take to church. But individually, the individual books, uh, Crossways uh, is the publisher of the ESV Bible. That's the um, that's the one I use, the translation I use, ESV. Uh, now, and just you know, as an aside here, I'll go off on the reservation here and and, and go off on a wild tear here. The way Bibles are translated is, is somewhat um, interesting. So there are uh, interpretations that try to get as literal to what the actual words in Greek or Hebrew say. There are those that try to balance between literal and readable. And there are those that try to contemporize it as much as possible, like the message. I don't like the ones that try to contemporize it as much as possible because those are the ones that I think really miss a lot of the depth, particularly when it comes to sociocultural issues these days. Uh, they, they really can miss the substance of what Scripture is saying as a way of popularizing it. Uh, the NIV, I think, the 1984 version, um, the newer versions of NIV, I think, go too much towards contemporary culture. So, for example, they take out male and female pronouns. They try to uh, be gender neutral. The problem with that is, um, well, for example, when Paul in Scripture says that um, we are all sons of the inheritance, what the NIV, newer NIV does is it changes that to we are all heirs of the inheritance as opposed to we are all sons of the inheritance. But this, this is, it's really important, I think, that people read the language sons of the inheritance because what it was saying at the time was absolutely groundbreaking. And when we say heirs, it misses it because in Roman culture, women could not inherit. It's verboten. A woman could not inherit. That's why there was never a female emperor 
women could not inherit. So when Paul is talking to um, a mixed gender audience and tells them, all of them, they're sons of the inheritance, what he's saying is revolutionary, that you, a woman, can also inherit as a son can. And you miss that with some of the language changes. It's why I prefer the ESV. It's not often as easy to read as the NIV in some cases, uh, but I think it, it it gets better to what the literal uh, words mean and the substance of the profound nature of some of it, like that passage. Um, that was probably way more than you wanted, Scott, but that was it. <laughs> All right, uh, back to the phones. Tim, Timothy, you're going to be up next. Welcome. Happy Fourth of July, Eric. Happy Fourth uh, of July. Thank you for addressing that poll that I saw the other day on Fox News where I had the independents at 52% here in Georgia for Stacey. People need to realize that Stacey is rebranding herself. I see commercials with her sitting in her kitchen dancing with kids around her, and she's telling everybody she's a business leader and all this stuff. I know I can take a bottle of arsenic, change the label, and put a milk label on it. It's not the label that hurts me. It's what's in that bottle. And people who keep on saying that uh, Kemp – they're not going to vote for Kemp because of what Donald Trump says. People need to realize that Donald Trump is richer than some countries. And what affects us here in Georgia won't affect him. He wants Kemp to lose. So he can gloat about it. But you and I have to live here. Our children have to live here, and our grandchildren have to live here. It will not affect him. And if he truly loved Georgia, he would fly up here, sit down with Kemp, and hash it out. But he won't do that because he's a proud and a prideful man. And that's yep. a sin. Uh, look, I agree with and you, and I want scary. you to know the the the. I think the best indicator for polling actually is the polling average, and when you add the Quinnipiac poll to the polling average in Georgia, uh, the polling average has Brian Kemp up four point eight points, uh, forty nine point four to forty four point six between Kemp and Abrams. Uh, Let me just give you this. Uh, Eastern Carolina University polling has Kemp up five. WXIA-TV has Kemp up five. Uh, Emerson polling has him up seven. The AJC has him up seven. Now, that's an older poll from back at the beginning of the year, that one. Um, Quinnipiac has him him tied. And even the Democrats are saying, really, Kemp probably has a five-point lead. So I would be dismissive of that Quinnipiac poll just because the Democrats themselves are saying that. Lewis, going to you next. Welcome. Derek, you know, that EPA ruling uh, is really going to put a neutral in the regulation in California uh, for trucks. Now, there's another part of that that they would want to upgrade the trucks, and that has to do with the electronic log. They want the, if the motor is past 2000 and back, the motor is not equipped to have the electronic log in there. And that's the, one of the only reasons, the other reason that they want the trucks updated but now uh the way that states if you have a truck that's older than 2000 and you're just one runner of that truck you don't have to have the eld you can run a paper log so now that's going to help drivers in california that run commercial in the port they won't have to worry about that emission thing but they will have to worry about that motor issue and electronic log because that's a federal deal yeah yeah, um, you know, so here's here's one of the issues with this as well is what I think we're going to see, Lewis, is uh, the environmental regulators are going to go back to the states now. If they can't get the executive branch to act because of the West Virginia versus EPA case, you're going to see 50 states passing regulations. Well, you're not going to see 50. You're going to see probably 10 or 12 uh, try to pass regulations. But keep in mind, uh, progressive states tried to do an interstate compact where they would essentially all artificially raise the costs of gas and other issues um, to disincentivize people. And you could not, they could not get the New England states to agree to the interstate compact because they didn't want higher gas prices up there. That's the, that's one of the big issues that people are going to have to keep in mind here is that uh, the states will be able to do regulations, but it's not necessarily a guarantee that they will outside of California. Marie, you're going to be up next. Welcome to the program, Marie. How are you? How are you, Eric? It's the first time I've ever called. And I just, well, I've got you. something on my mind. It's just driving me crazy. All right. Okay, so, well, with the election that we had and when, when Biden won, we, everybody thought Trump was going to win. And then everybody was just standing with their mouth open when all this stuff went on and he won. 
So why, what happens if this happens again? If we because everybody thinks, oh, you know, they're gonna they're gonna vote uh, Republican because they're sick of the Democrats, where everybody everybody is. Well, what happens if for some reason <laughs> that they get back in there? I mean, we're screwed. I mean, that's what I think. Well, look. But, um, I mean, so the Democrats are already saying if somehow they are able to use the gun control decision and the abortion decision of the court to hold the Senate and, and keep the House. Uh, if they can gain seats in the Senate, what they intend to do is get rid of the filibuster, make Puerto Rico and D.C. states so they can get four more senators, and then make abortion the law of the land. So, yeah, there's a real concern there, and Republicans are going to have to turn up and vote. Uh, the big issue here, though, Marie, and it's the one I think people need to understand, is there's so much angst over what's happening right now, so much angst about the economy, so much angst about the state of the nation that I do think a voter backlash is coming. Now, it may be tempered some in some parts of the nation by what the Supreme Court did, but those are already areas of the country where the Republicans are already fighting a tough uphill fight. So, for example, there are some seats in the country in the in the House where Joe Biden won by 10 points. And Republicans for a while have said, uh, that they thought they could play in those seats. I don't know that they can after the Dobbs decision. So they may not pick up 40 seats in the House, but they'll still pick up 20 seats in the House. And that's enough for them to take the majority. The real issue is the Senate. There are some clunker candidates out there. Uh, Herschel Walker, for better or worse, in Georgia is a clunker candidate. I still think he can win, but he's not the best candidate. Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania is losing. Interestingly enough, Doug Mastriano, the Republican gubernatorial candidate, is polling better than Oz. Uh, Oz is deeply disliked by even Republican voters. I still think he can win, but we need to acknowledge he's not a great candidate. Uh, every candidate Donald Trump has endorsed, with the exception of J.D. Vance for the Senate, is behind the Democrats in the general election polling. And that's striking. Uh, and Adam Laxalt as well defies that. He and J.D. Vance uh, are are winning their races. But, you know, you got to win uh, the new Nevada. you got to win in Arizona. you got to win in Georgia. you got to win in Pennsylvania to take the Senate. And right now the Republicans are picking the candidates most likely to lose to the Democrats. Democrats are helping fund them in some cases. But that's not the case in Pennsylvania. That's not the case in Georgia. And that's kind of the problem. Republicans have. Now, before I take any more phone calls, let me let me do some good clock management here um, and tell you about Eden Pure and the thunderstorm. Clear the air on this one. Um, I want to. I get asked a lot about the Eden Pure thunderstorm more than anything else that I recommend to you guys. I get a lot of questions about the Eden Pure. Do I really use it? Let me tell you how I use it because yes, I really do. I don't use it all the time. What I use it for is several scenarios where it really is a lifesaver and a game changer. One is in my kitchen, we don't have an exhaust vent. You know, if you fry, and I make a lot of onion rings, y'all have seen the pictures, um, you have the fry odors in your house, particularly if I fry shrimp. The Eden Pure Thunderstorm eliminates odors. And so I'll put it in the kitchen where we don't have an exhaust vent to eliminate the odors. Instead of using essential oils and stuff that just masks the odors, we eliminate the odors. The other thing is I always keep one in my travel bag wherever I go. If my hotel room smells funny or a rental car smells bad, I plug in the Eden Pure Thunderstorm and it wipes out those odors. That's how I use my Eden Pure Thunderstorm. I don't use it as an air purifier per se, although it will get rid of the mildew, the mold, the pollen, the bacteria. I use it as an odor eater. It wipes out the odors wherever I put it, and it really does work. And you can get three of them, uh, one for your upstairs, one for your downstairs, one for your travel bag like me, or if you have an RV, you got a camper or something, you can leave one there. You can plug it in with a USB cord or you can plug it into a wall outlet. It works just as good either way. You get three of them for less than $200 by going to EdenPureDeals.com and you put in my discount code ERIC3, E-R-I-C-K-3. It'll take you to the Eden Pure Thunderstorm 3-pack. You put it in your shopping cart, click checkout, and away you go. You get three of them for less than $200. You are saving $200. You get free shipping. It genuinely works. The Eden Pure Thunderstorm 3-pack, EdenPureDeals.com. The discount code is ERIC3. All right. We're going to go back to the phones. Let's see here. Uh, Donald, you're going to be up next. Welcome to the program. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for taking my call, Eric. The reason I'm calling is uh, 
this morning I was watching a, a show on TV. I think it's called Morning Joe on a certain liberal oh, yeah. channel. And they're giddy about a, a possible indictment of Donald Trump. My question to you is, what would uh, an indictment of Donald Trump do nationally t- to the dynamic to, to affect the dynamic of, of the midterm elections? That's all right. So I, I will say, uh, Donald, first of all, I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, they've been saying it's the beginning of the end and the walls are closing in on Trump for five years now. I don't think it's going to happen. I, I think it's essentially wish casting by the left. Uh, if it did happen, I don't actually think it has an impact. I mean, we, we, the majority of voters in polling already say they blame Donald Trump for what happened on January 6th. They think he provoked it, inspired it, organized it, whatever. And it's not hurting the GOP. I don't think an indictment of Trump does either. Uh, If anything, I think it might help the Republicans because it would make people breathe a little easier that, well, he's going to be out of the picture and the GOP won't get their marching orders from him. Um, It it may actually be something that blows up in the Democrats' face, but I really genuinely don't think it's going to happen. I I, I just I don't believe it. Um, let's see. Uh, I want to go, Paul, you're going to be next. Welcome. Paul. Hey, Eric. Yeah, I'm here, Eric. Thank you. Sure. What's going on? Um, the... I'm sorry. I was on the speakerphone. I'm off now. All right. Uh, what's going okay. on? We got about a minute. Uh, okay. Well, I was going to point out, I haven't heard anybody else say this, but the, the similarity of the attacks on Judge Kavanaugh just just came right back to me when the young 23-year-old woman began to say things in the hearing that were incredible on their face. And it kind of reminded me of Dr. Blasey Ford when you don't need to confirm those things because some of those things were impossible and couldn't have happened. And that destroys the entire credibility of a witness as far as I'm concerned. Your yeah, you, you know, I, I, look, I, I appreciate you saying that because I know people who know Cassidy Hutchinson. They say that uh, she she had a lot of firsthand eyewitness testimony of stuff that she said. They regret that the media focused instead on all the salacious details The problem here, though, is that they did focus on the salacious details, and in doing so, I think they discredit everything. Let me me just put this mantra. I made this. Let me play this for you. Hutchinson's testimony was breathtaking in scope and devastating in details, including that presidential limo assault that she described. He tried to strangle his Secret Service agent. This is where I confess that I cannot recall ever having heard another example of a president trying to physically hijack his own motorcade. I mean, have you as anyone? But what people are going to take away from this is that image inside the beast, which is what they call the presidential limousine. I mean, it's astonishing. That's an image you're never going to forget. Peter, I know you have some major new reporting. A source close to the Secret Service is telling you that, that the lead agent disputes some of Hutchinson's testimony. Yeah, so let's walk right through that now, Tom, if we can. That source close to the Secret Service uh, tells me that both the lead agent, Bobby Engel, and the driver of that presidential limousine, the SUV, are prepared to testify under oath that neither man was assaulted and that Mr. Trump never lunged for the steering wheel. That was the key part of her testimony that everybody focused on. Ask any trial lawyer what happens in court when this happens. It destroys her whole credibility. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.